Good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Amy Fredrigel and I'm the Managing Director of the Sustainable Growth Coalition at Environmental Initiative. We are excited to have all of you here today at this webinar. For those of you who may be less familiar with our organization, I thought I could share a bit about us. Environmental Initiative is a nearly 30-year-old nonprofit that builds partnerships to develop collaborative solutions to environmental problems. By working in this way, we can achieve more effective and longer lasting solutions for a healthy environment, prosperous economy, and an equitable society. Today, our webinar objectives are to learn about new tools to more accurately quantify the carbon footprint and renewable share of your purchased electricity, to help capture a fuller value for your clean energy investments, and to bolster confidence by your investors, customers, and stakeholders through carbon and renewable reporting. I'd like to share a little bit more about the Sustainable Growth Coalition, a program area of environmental initiative. As you can see from the logos on this slide, the coalition is a leadership group comprised of many well-known companies headquartered in Minnesota, as well as partners in the public and nonprofit sectors. We were founded five years ago when eight members of these companies came to our CEO and asked Environmental Initiative to help them go farther, faster together to advance circularity through corporate sustainability. Thanks to those leaders five years ago, our vision is to advance the circular economy for the growth and prosperity of our region. We use a systems approach to advance our vision at the societal level. Many people are not familiar with circularity, so I wanted to share how we think about it. A circular economy is a thriving system that values and preserves all types of capital. Resources and talents are utilized to their highest potential, and all inputs are used and then reused to continue to serve our needs in a cyclical fashion. The result of a functioning circular economy is a continuous positive development cycle. The coalition focuses on systemically approaching energy, water, and materials to advance circularity. This systems approach could not be more relevant today as we manage through a world grappling with a pandemic and racial inequality. True sustainability and circularity cannot be achieved without equity and inclusion. As we use our positions of power and privilege to help build back better, we are focusing on economic development, including catalyzing wealth creation in communities of color. We are publishing case studies other than the one here today to shine a light on examples of this type of leadership. We're seeking additional case studies from coalition members, so if you have a great story to tell, please let us know. The coalition is an interesting group in that we include many industries and business models, as well as both utilities and utility customers. This collaboration is important because it's a team effort to transition to the new climate economy, requiring that stakeholders coordinate to solve systemic challenges. Our members individually already have made a major impact regionally, nationally, and around the world. But together we know we can more effectively address natural resource scarcity and take advantage of opportunities from evolving customer preferences. This coalition collaboration is, is what resulted in the pilot project highlighted in the case study we will talk about today. And later on in the slide deck, we'll have a link so you can download a copy of the case study that we're releasing. While you'll be hearing from several private sector leaders today, we know that the full stakeholder suite includes the public sector and communities to advance societal goals on energy and climate. This case study can be applied to the corporate sector, cities, state entities, and other institutions to help better your energy related reporting. The reason these members are here today is because of their company's enterprise wide commitments to energy and climate. Those goals are what sparked our member adopted energy vision, which states that we want to surpass economy wide greenhouse gas emission targets. Increase access to clean energy to improve racial, economic, social and public health outcomes and fuel economic growth for all. 
our members tell us that their top sustainability drivers are customers, investors, and employees. There is a robust business case for clean energy and the new climate economy, such as reducing costs and risks, being ahead of customer and investor demand by creating new products, services, and markets, growing job opportunities, and attracting and retaining top talent, and improving quality of life and healthy communities. The focus of this webinar derives from our transition to clean energy focal area in our energy vision. We also have four other focal areas, as you can see on this slide, and they include conservation, system optimization, electrification, and greenhouse gas capture and use. If you would like to get more involved with our energy issues, a few key work streams include our EV fleet team to keep our companies and our region more competitive, advocating for transmission infrastructure to meet renewable, to meet renewable goals, affordability, and reliability, and exploring intersecting issues with water, materials, and equity through our circularity task force by building relationships with impacted communities. So to help us understand where you are all coming from for our discussion today, let's learn a little bit more about you. So please go to menti.com and use the code 921019. And we have a couple of questions for you there, such as what sectors are you representing? And you can choose all that apply, business, nonprofit, public sector more general, public sector government, public sector academia, or other. So that's at menti.com with 921019. Anything else, Bridget, that I missed on the menti poll? as people are logging on there? I don't think so. I think we can switch over to looking at the results that are coming in here, Jillian. It looks like people are clicking in, so thank you very much. Bridget also has in the chat box as well, and she mentioned during the tech tips too that feel free to not only send us notes, but um, use the chat box to share links to resources or let other people on the call know about things that you might want to share with the broader group. You're more than welcome to do that. It's always a handy resource, I know, during these Zooms. Okay, this is interesting. So it looks like some answers are coming in right now, about half business, a quarter nonprofit, about a quarter um, academia, with maybe a little less than 10% government, a few other, okay, it looks like a um, few more nonprofit folks. It's always kind of fun to see these results come in. Okay, so a little less than half of you are from business and um, maybe about a fifth and a fifth from nonprofit and academia and then um, some others from government. Great, okay, that helps us know more about you and then we would also know what role, what types of jobs do you have? Because we all see the world from different perspectives and have different responsibilities. So the next question is about what role you have at your organization in relation to sustainability more generally or energy or climate goals, if you happen to have that specific of a job. And, and once again, you can choose all that apply. Mm -hmm. So we have measure and or calculate carbon footprint, set goals of carbon reduction, execute on the goals, cross-functional strategy, executive management, marketing communications, public affairs. And because we're kind of tying for um, measuring, calculating carbon, executing on the goals, cross-functional strategy. Ooh, cross-functional strategy is taking the lead here. <laughs> Great. And some public affairs and marketing. So folks that are both doing maybe some of the a nice mix of quantitative and qualitative. Great, this is really helpful for us to know more about you. And also, as the, um, I'd be curious to know if we missed any um, thing, feel free to chat that in the, in the chat box as well. And then I think we have one more 
poll for you. And that is, what type of organizational sustainability goals do you currently have? Please choose that all that apply. And so we have greenhouse gas, or carbon reduction more generally, energy efficiency, energy conservation, a goal to use more renewable energy, a goal to, to um, use greenhouse gas or carbon-free energy, reduction in natural gas usage, reduction in transportation-related greenhouse gas emissions, electrifying your fleet, uh, goals in alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, none but that you have something currently in progress or other. And if we missed your type of goal and you have an other, please add that in the chat box because I think it'd be interesting us for, to see what some of the trends are. Looks like, okay, it looks like energy efficiency, oh, greenhouse gas generally 29% and then conservation and then renewables. And then carbon free is the next one. And about 15% of you right now have transportation related greenhouse gas emissions, 10% reduction in natural gas usage. This is really interesting. Great, it's fun. We did a survey of our members fleets last year and um, kind of interesting to see how things have evolved just even in the last year on the transportation sector as well. Okay, great. Well, thanks for sharing that information about your organization so we can understand where you're coming from. Now I would like to welcome our speakers. We're joined by several of our coalition member leaders to talk about our collaborative efforts between utilities and utility customers. So our presenters today include Daniel Katzenberger from Best Buy, Nick Martin, and Dan King from XL Energy. Our panelists are going to share some initial remarks and slides, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So at any point in time, once again, feel free to start sharing your questions in the chat box. So our first speaker is Daniel Katzenberger. Dan is a sustainability and renewable energy program manager within Best Buy's corporate responsibility and sustainability teams. He manages Best Buy's scopes one and two carbon emissions, including setting and meeting Best Buy's science-based targets and 2050 carbon neutrality goals. So with that, I will pass the mic over to Daniel. Thanks, Amy. And uh, this is my first presentation where I'm not controlling the slide. So um, give me just a little bit of leeway in case I uh, forget to say next slide, please. So the outline of what I want to talk about today, um, a little bit about Best Buy, not much, but just so you have context of where I am coming from. Um, scope of today's discussion and scope is um, kind of in quotes because we're going to be talking about uh, carbon scopes, scope one, scope two, and scope three. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Best Buy's carbon footprint. Um, where are, where have we, you know, where have we been starting in 2009? Where are we today? Talk about how we use that to set our carbon goals and targets. Um, and then get in a little bit of detail about carbon calculation considerations. Um, a little bit of, uh, not very wonky, but just a little bit down into the weeds so you can understand um, some things to consider. And we tried to keep this high level because we have a very broad range of people, as you saw in the kind of the questions at the beginning. So we've got everybody from executive management down to uh, people that execute on these goals. We have a lot of public sector uh, people. And so I, I am also on my city's conservation commission. So I'm familiar with both the setting the goals process and now trying to meet those goals. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then that leads right into the emission reduction strategies. So what can we do uh, to help reduce our carbon footprints? And I'll transition to how we're working with XL Energy uh, to do some of these things. And then XL Energy will take over uh, from there. And they've got a couple of presentations on programs that they have available to help us all meet our carbon goals. Uh, so with that, next slide. Uh, so this is a little bit about Best Buy. We are located in Richfield, our, our headquarters, although no one is there. Everyone is working from home right now. So we're located all over uh, the Twin Cities and the United States. We have about a thousand retail stores located throughout uh, the United States, Mexico, Canada, and Puerto Rico. Um, 
we have 125,000 employees and I have an asterisk there that's pre-COVID. So we do have some employees um, on furlough right now, uh, trying to get them back into the stores as quickly as we can, as quickly as we are allowed to. Uh, but just so you know that these numbers are all pre, pre-COVID and things have changed drastically. And I've, I've actually got a slide to talk a little bit about how that's affected our carbon footprint. Uh, so next slide. So one thing when you're talking about carbon and carbon footprints is you have to start with the why, with the purpose. And so Best Buy's mission, and this we've had this mission for about six years now, to positively, positively impact the world, enrich people's lives through technology, and contribute to the common good, right? So we've got these, this overarching mission for the entire company. And the fact we want to positive, positively impact the world drives our, our sustainability uh, and circular economy work. It's why we're on the Minnesota Sustainable Growth Coalition. It's why we do this carbon work, and it's why we're trying to, uh, you know, be be good stewards of the environment because we we do want to have a positive impact on the world. So next slide. Uh, we do tie our goals, our sustainability and environmental goals, to the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, as you see there. Um, so there's always a work in progress as we're trying to figure out. You know, you've got you've got business case, you've got the environmental case, you've got the environmental social governance case. And we're trying to always figure out how we can have the best impact to use our platform as kind of a large US-based company, Fortune 100 company. How could we use kind of our influence to, to better the world? And, um, and that ties into our kind of UN Sustainable Development Goals work. Next slide, please. So another reason why we do this, climate change does have material impacts to Best Buy, right? So there are storms. We did have, uh, you know, we went through the hurricanes in uh, Texas and New York and um, Puerto Rico, and, and it affects our stores, it affects our employees, it affects our uh, communities that we operate in. Um, so this is a real material impact. This isn't just, you know, it's not just we're doing this for reputational value or whatever, whatever reasons people might have to do it. We, we are doing this because this is a real impact that we see in our business. And, and we want to, to help not have this happen for us and for others. Yeah, and go into the next slide, it's fine. Um, just a couple of slides here about kind of these environmental indices too. So everything we do gets looked at through a hundred, uh, you know, uh, magnifying glasses. Everybody is looking at what we do financially, environmentally, socially with our governance programs. And so we've got all these places we either report out to or that collects data from the public and they report back to us how we're doing. So we are very conscious about how the market sees us in terms of our environmental and sustainability actions. And so this just uh, reflects some of the people that are looking at what we do. And then the next slide is, you know, we don't, we don't do this for awards, but it helps us when we get feedback from the market that we are doing good things. So when the market uh, rewards us with some kind of recognition, um, we take that as we're going in the right direction. So, so that's what that slide is for. Next slide. Okay, so the scope, and there, there it is in quotes of today's discussion. So there are three scopes of carbon, and I apologize for the people that are experts in this, but we do have a range of folks in the call. Um, Scope one, when you're talking about carbon emissions, right? Scope one are the things that you burn at your facility. So if, uh, if you're an electric utility and you have a natural gas powered plant, that's gonna be coming, uh, that's a scope one emission. Um, if you're Best Buy, you have a fleet, you're burning gasoline, diesel, or you have buildings that are heated with natural gas, those are all scope one emissions. Scope two emissions, that's energy that you're purchasing, but you're not burning any fossil fuels for that energy. So for Best Buy, we buy electricity, and in this case, uh, as an example, from XL Energy. So scope two, that's our scope two emissions. Now, XL Energy is making that electricity with a lot of different, they're using nuclear, they're using um, wind, solar, all different kinds of formats. Some of that electricity is made bur by burning fossil fuels. And so that's, that becomes our scope two emissions. We claim the, the fossil fuels that XL Energy is burning or that all the utilities are burning in our scope to emissions. And that's in the red box. That's really what we're going to be talking about today. Today, I just put scope three on here. It's out of the scope of my talk, but I wanted you to be aware. If you see the two green, the longest green arrows in that, that graphic, that's the scope three emissions. There are 15 categories within that. 
Best Buy's largest scope three emission category is called use of sold products. So think of Best Buy, everything we sell, most of it is electronic. Most of it people buy, they take home and they plug into the wall and then they use that, that product for five, 10, 15 years. So when we sell a product, we have to claim the amount of emissions that that product is going to produce over its life, right? So if you have a, let's say a refrigerator, refrigerator's average life is 11 years. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it will use whatever, 500 kilowatt hours a year. So we multiply 11 times 500, you get 5,500 kilowatt hours. And then we have to claim that as a scope three emission in our carbon inventory. And I won't go into that in any detail, but I just want you to be aware because there is a slide that talks about that. So you can see the effect that emission has on our entire uh, corporate, corporate, corporate emission and corporate goals. Okay, next slide. So getting a little bit of the details of our carbon emissions, as I mentioned, we're in US, Canada, and Mexico. You'll see the US is, um, it's a little blurry on my slide. Let me go to my screen so I can see the actual numbers. Yeah, so the US is about 93% of our total uh, scope one and scope two carbon emissions. So this is what we call operational emissions, scope one and scope two. Um, by energy source, electricity is the largest contributor to our scope one, or that's to our uh, scope one and scope two emissions at scope two. Fuel comes in second. So fuel would be um, our fleet and, uh, and our Geek Squad vehicles uh, that go out to people's homes. We also do have natural gas, so we heat our buildings. Um, so there's a natural gas footprint. And then other would be things like refrigerants and purchasing of steam and purchasing of hot water. Those are a little bit smaller, but uh, just to get an idea that US retail and, and the US market is the biggest part of our scope two footprint. Okay, next slide. So historical emissions, this shows we started this journey. I've only been with Best Buy for two years, but they started the journey back in 2009. Uh, we originally started out with about a million metric tons of carbon emissions a year for scope one and scope two. You'll see the uh, um, scope one is shown in kind of that light blue on the top. So that's again, fuel, natural gas uh, that we burn. And then scope two is the gray bar that's below and that's all the electricity. And what you'll see here is the blue bar right now, it's kind of staying constant from 2009 until today. The blue bar doesn't really get, uh, have much change. And that's because we don't have many solutions in the in the fleet space yet, right? We've converted our Geek Squad vehicles to Priuses, so that has helped uh, double our fuel efficiency in that fleet. Uh, but for the the larger rigs, the big box trucks, the eighteen wheelers, those kinds of things, uh, there hasn't been a lot of options to to decarbonize that market yet. And we're working on that through the Sustainable Growth Coalition right now. But we have had great opportunities in the electric market. So those gray bars you'll see are getting smaller from 2009 to 2019. So we've cut our um, electricity quite a bit through both efficiency, through um, basically turning things off, uh, what they call a megawatt, right? Turning things off when you don't need them, turning lights off at night, things like that. And then greening of the grid. And so you'll see those key drivers on the right, those are year over year. So from 2018, 2019, We've reduced our electricity use in our stores by 11%. A lot of that was through, we've, we completed last year and the year before a complete LED lighting retrofit of most, almost all of our 1000 stores. So that helped reduce our electricity use. A cleaner grid. So this is what XL Energy is going to talk about. And all the utilities, a lot of them around the country are, uh, you know, they're getting rid of coal plants. They're putting in more renewables. The grid nationwide is getting cleaner. And when we're doing our carbon footprints, we can take credit for the cleaner grid and our carbon footprints. I'm gonna talk a little bit later about how this affects renewable energy goals. It's, it's accounted for a little bit differently, but we're just talking carbon now. So that cleaner grid counts. And then under DC miles driven, that's uh, distribution centers, uh, miles. Um, you know, especially uh, uh, um, with people buying more things online. So we're having more, you know, deliveries. We're having more, more people buy things online and it has to be delivered. So we're having an increase in fuel use due to that. And that increases our, our carbon emissions in that category. So next slide. So this is the same information, just kind of shown differently. You'll see the electricity on the left and you'll see that we've had you know, significant reductions in electricity use. And again, that is um, both from efficiency, 
and from greening of the grid, you'll see that thing that goes negative. The next thing is called car, our electric offset. So we do buy renewable energy credits and we have other programs in place to help us reduce our electricity use. So that's shown negative. The natural gas, that's our heating of our stores. Refrigerants, that's uh, from emissions from refrigerants that get released from air conditioning systems. Uh, Geek Squad, I mentioned, you can see that line goes down. That's when we bought the uh, Priuses. We uh, you know, changed our fleet from traditional cars, I think they were VW Bugs uh, or something, to Priuses. And then the fleet, you'll see it's relatively flat, but um, we're becoming more efficient in how we deliver, but the, the, what we deliver, the amount of what we deliver. TVs have gotten bigger, right? So we used to deliver 40 inch TVs, now we're delivering 80 inch TVs. Um, appliances are, you know, we, we're selling a lot of larger appliances and things like that, so. Okay, next slide. So here's where I wanted to talk just a little bit about the scope three emissions. And this, this data is from 2017, but it's, it's roughly equivalent to today. I just had the slide available. Um, so in the top, in the red box, that's Best Buy's operations emissions. So that is all of our scope one and scope two emissions um, in that kind of light blue bar. The bottom bar though, that shows our scope three emissions. The, the dark part of that is owned brands, brands that we manufacture, and the gray part is things that we buy. So that would be like Apple, I, you know, iPhones and printers and computers and sound bars and whatever. So what you'll notice is that our scope three emissions, our use of sold products, is about 30 times what our scope one and scope two emissions are, right? So we've spent the last 11 years working on our scope one and scope two emissions to get those down as much as possible. And we'll have reduced those by 60% by the end of this year. That was our goal and we are going to achieve that goal. And so that's all been great. But two years ago when I started at Best Buy, we, we started looking at scope three. We did this calculation and we're like, okay, we need to, uh, we need to really think about how do we address the scope three because it, it is a big part of our footprint. Um, and, and so this just illustrates that it's 30 times what our scope one and scope two are. And just, this is just an interesting fact. The product categories that we sell constitute about 25% of the average household carbon emissions and energy expense of, uh, you know, homeowners each year. So 25% of the electricity that most of us on this call use in your house comes from products that Best Buy sells. It's not that we sell 100% of the market. We don't have 100% market share. But that, that just shows how big the product categories are that we sell. And so that's why we think it's, it's a responsibility of ours to help reduce those emissions. Okay, next slide, please. So this is where we get into the goals. So first you figure out where you're at. You have to measure where you're at. And then you say, okay, what goals are we going to set to help, to help reduce these emissions? And then so we already had, before I came to Best Buy, we had a goal to reduce carbon emissions 60% by 2020. We also had a, uh, this carbon neutrality aspirational goal uh, by 2050. So there is a difference between uh, commitment, right? Where you're saying we are going to do this. You're telling the market and your investors, we are going to be 60% reduced by 2020. That's a commitment. Um, aspiration is we want to be carbon neutral by 2050. And I think you'll see this with utility goals as well. They have commitments and then they have aspirations. So that was before I came. When I got to Best Buy two years ago, we, we went about setting a, a science-based target. So it's a very specific protocol for setting goals that meet uh, the, uh, the Paris Accord Agreement requirement for limiting the temperatures of global warming to either two degrees, well below two degrees, or 1.5 degrees C. Our goal is currently well below two degrees. What that means is we need to achieve in red, a 75% reduction by 2030. So we're going to achieve 60% this year. We need to get an additional 15% out by 2030. And then obviously our goal is to get it, have 100% out by 2050. We've also set a goal around our scope three emissions. So we wanna help our customers reduce their emissions by 20% by 2030 from 2017. That's a requirement of science-based targets. That's when we did the, the calculations. And ultimately, if we're successful in doing that, which we hope we will be, uh, we'll help our customers save $5 billion in energy costs over that time frame. Um, and then over on the right, there is a, a just a nod to circular economy. We're not talking about that today, 
but we are developing circular economy goals, working with uh, other NGOs and industry leaders in the space, as well as Minnesota Sustainable Growth Coalition. So that's one of the major goals of the Growth Coalition. Okay, next slide. So this is a this work gets a little bit wonky, and I'm not going to get too much into the detail of this. But I just wanted to show you um, kind of how we're tracking across these goals. You'll see a black line kind of starting at the upper left at, at about a million. Like I said, 2009, our carbon emissions were about a million metric tons a year. The goal was to be 60% reduced, so that takes it down to about 400,000 by 2020, and that's where we're at now. And then the aspirational goal, you'll see it goes out um, uh, to the right, and then I kind of hid the future work because we're, there's a lot of work still to be done there. Uh, but that's our aspirational goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. And in fact, we're trying to push that up, um, which is another reason I hid that because it's not, our goal is right now is 2050, but we're trying to make that even sooner. So follow the black line, that's our goal. Now the red line is our performance. So how have we done against that goal? Below the black line is good, above the black line would be bad. So, so we've basically overachieved uh, every year from 2009 until now. And then this year, we're, we'll, we will overachieve again, but we don't know where we're going to be exactly by the end of the year. So it, I just showed it ending right at the 20% or the 60% reduction by 2020. What's interesting, I'm going to talk about a project that we just uh, um, launched or just came online in February. And that's a large solar system that we uh, invested in in South Carolina. And that's why you'll notice the, um, how can I describe this? So starting at the red line, the end of the red line, you'll see that the blue line above goes way down, right? There's a steep drop. And that steep drop is the startup of the solar plant. And what it's basically saying is we're getting a significant larger number of uh, percentage of renewable electricity in our system. And so by the end of next year, by next year, uh, we will have reached what's called RE100 or Renewable Energy 100. All of our electricity will be being provided by uh, renewable sources. Now we don't have a renewable energy goal, an RE100 goal. It's just that our carbon reduction efforts are gonna take us beyond what RE100 requires. And that's what that red circle is trying to show. So I know this is a little bit wonky. Um, we didn't want to get too much into the weeds. Feel free to ask questions at the end if any of this doesn't make sense, or, uh, or feel free to email me or, or call me if you want to talk about this offline. Okay, next slide. As people's eyes glaze over. Okay, so this one is just an interesting slide. Um, it's a little bit of an off uh, side conversation. But what this is showing is how is COVID-19 impacting our, our scope to emissions, our purchases of electricity. You'll notice in January and February, the yellow bar is slightly less than the blue bar. And I already mentioned why. That's because of our LED lighting retrofits from, that, that happened over the last year and also greening of the grid. So those two things have, have before COVID, reduced our carbon emissions. Now, after COVID, March, April, and May, we had to shut all of our stores down. Um, in March, it was part of the month. April, it was the entire month. And so you'll notice that our carbon footprints for those months have gone down quite significantly. The yellow bars are much, much shorter than the blue bars from last year. So that's showing the effect of COVID. And also the effect of, you know, how do we do that? Stores are, are scheduled to operate, you know, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day that's, you got a thousand stores, you just schedule them that way. So, you know, you have to have people go in and actually turning things off in order to gain this, this advantage of the, you know, not running, not operating the stores, um, turning, changing thermostats and things like that. So that's all of the efforts by other people within the company that are, that are doing things to try to reduce the carbon footprint when the stores were, were not operational because of COVID. So I just thought that was an interesting slide to share. Okay, next slide. Okay, now we're gonna get into the like emission calculations considerations, which is why some of you are here anyway, I know. So as I mentioned, Best Buy operates in three countries, all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico. <clears throat> um, it, you know, we have over 200, we, we buy electricity from over 200 utilities and we operate not only in all of those states, but each of those states 
is under the control, the electric systems are under the, the management, I should say, of regional transmission organizations or ISOs. There's lots of different names for them, um, but they're the people that control what, uh, you know, what generating sources come online and when they prioritize those sources. And, and they kind of operate the markets that set prices in some markets. What this comes down to is you'll, you're on the right there, you're seeing MISO. So we're doing a lot of work with Minnesota Sustainable Growth Coalition in the MISO market. And as Amy mentioned, one of the things we're looking at is how can we get more transmission, uh, more power lines in the MISO market so that we can have access to more renewable, renewable electricity, right? Um, so these are kind of the things we're getting into when we're doing carbon calculations. You have to know where the carbon data is coming from, right? So um, one way you can get carbon data is just go to the Energy Information Administration and say, what is the average uh, emissions for the United States? And you get a number, so many tons of carbon per kilowatt hour or megawatt hour of electricity produced. So that's the very highest level. It's the least accurate on, an, on a local basis, but it's the easiest to do. Um, you can also get data at the state level, so that's called eGrid, and there's a link at the bottom of that slide that talks about you can download data at the state level, and I've got some slides that will go into the differences by state, or you can get it by the ISO or the RTO, and that's really the best way to do it right now is to download data from each regional transmission organization um, and then apply that to your carbon. So I've got a building, let's say I've got a 30,000 foot store um, in, in Minneapolis. So I would go and say, okay, how much electricity does that store use in kilowatt hours? What is the carbon factor of the neighborhood I'm in, whether I do that at the utility level, at the ISO level, or the state level, and I multiply those two together and that gives me my carbon footprint for that store for scope two emissions. So this is some of the detail and, and I'm gonna get to into one slide and there are some utilities that are actually now putting out daily curves. Like you can see what the electricity use is on a daily basis or on a five minute, 15 minute basis. So you can get really granular, really precise on your, your carbon emissions. Best Buy doesn't do that. We do our calculations at the utility level where that information is available, the RTO level where the utility information is not available. And there are a few places where we have to use state averages um, because they're kind of, uh, they're kind of way out in the rural areas. So those are few and far between. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is talking about um, how do we get data from utilities? So it used to be, like I said, we have over 200 utilities. If we wanted to get the correct data, we would have to send a letter or an email to each of those companies and say, please tell me for 2019, what was your carbon emissions per megawatt hour, right? Pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. I'm the one doing the scope two emissions and there's no way I have time to manage that type of an effort to contact over 200 utilities, collect all that data and include that in our carbon calculations. Uh, so what has happened is EEI, uh, the Edison Electric Institute, they have a program where they've standardized the forms that get sent out to utilities and utilities have been filling out these forms and sending them back to, to EEI and they're, they're collecting the data. So this is just showing uh, the two utilities in Minnesota uh, that have submitted these forms in the past two years and what, what the results show. So for example, you see an XL Energy uh, in Minnesota, and it also covers Michigan, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. Their carbon emissions went from 821 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour, 2018, down to 791 pounds uh, per megawatt hour in 2019. So that that is accounting, that's the greening of the grid. That is XL Energy shutting down coal-fired power plants and replacing them with the natural gas or renewable energy plants. Um, and that's showing the, the benefit we get from the grid from that. But you can just see the range of emission factors, and in the next few slides we'll talk about this. Um, different utilities, different RTOs, ISOs, and different states have significantly different carbon outputs based on uh, the electricity they produce. This is one of the places you can get that information. And again, the link is at the bottom of those slides, which will be available after this presentation for people that want to go and really dig into the details of that uh, data. So next slide, please. Same, Dan, as we're transitioning the next slide, let's just do a quick time check. Yep. Why don't we do about three more minutes on your slides just to leave time for our yep. Excel 
speakers. And then if there's time for Q&A, we can really, I know you've got a lot of great detail here. Um, yep. So thanks for all of that. No, okay, perfect. Thanks. Sounds good. So this one just showing, I mentioned hourly data. So in California, you can get some hourly curve data. And you'll see on the right there, there's a blue box. The blue box is when a typical Best Buy store operates from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And you'll notice that the carbon output is very different in California, depending on what time of day the, that store is operating. So the way we're doing carbon calculations, we have one number we use for the entire year. But if we are more sophisticated, and if all this information was available, we could actually start looking at hourly, hourly use within each store to figure out when we should be operating our systems, right? So obviously we shouldn't be operating our air conditioners uh, after 5 p.m. in California because the carbon footprint goes way up, it goes sky high. Um, yeah, so go ahead and uh, let's see which slides to do next. Uh, emission source priorities I've already talked about. Uh, go, to the, go to the slide that shows a national average. Yeah, that one, one more, 37. And, uh, and this is basically showing that coal, starting around 2008, has really uh, been in a decline in the US. Natural gas and renewables have increased. Let's just do the next two slides and then we'll skip and we can save the last for the, um, for the end. So slide 38. And so this is showing Vermont, which is the cleanest state in the nation. Their carbon uh, emissions are 0.1 pound of, uh, or yeah, it's per megawatt hour, but 0.1 pound ton of, I should get the units on there, 0.1 metric ton of CO2 emissions per megawatt hour. And you'll see they were mostly nuclear, but now they're mostly hydroelectric. Go to Minnesota next. Show that Minnesota, you'll see the coal footprint is getting smaller. They're at one uh, metric ton. So we're about average for the United States. And then the last one there is uh, Wyoming, and they're almost all coal. So they're at two metric tons per megawatt hour. So what that's basically showing is uh, you have to know where you're at in the country in order to know um, what what the you know what the carbon output of the electric is of your scope two emissions, and then that will drive your carbon emissions. So I do have a lot more slides, but for time, I'll stop there. Turn it over to Excel Energy, Great. and then during the QA session, we'll uh, uh, answer questions. Fabulous. Dan, so had, much great information. And I had one quick yeah, go question ahead, pop in that I think would be real easy to answer. Um, so you, for the 56% reduction, is that for scopes one and two? Yeah. So when we're, when we're setting our what we call operational carbon emissions, it's scope one and scope two emissions. Now, what most companies are finding that set these emission targets it's easier to hit the scope one target. So we're not 60% scope one and 60% scope two. We're gonna be more than 60% scope two and less than 60% scope one. So that's why we need to talk about electrification of fleets and how are we gonna electrify our buildings so that we can get that scope one also down um, by 2030. So. Great, Great. fabulous and thanks for the question and passing that off. Bridget, keep them coming. And um, thanks so much, Dan. That was just a wealth of information. Bridget has shared a link to the PDF of the slides too, so you can drill down and really just see all of the great information that Dan had included there. And with them up on the screen right now is a picture of our case study that we released. And in the case study, what we did is work actually with Target Corporation in a similar fashion to what Dan just described with Best Buy and Excel Energy. And so um, that is a synopsis of what we're talking about today. So please take a look and download that report. And that's a great way to segue to our next speakers. We're gonna be hearing from several leaders at Excel Energy. Nick Martin is the manager of Env energy and environmental policy, part of a team spearheading the company's strategy for affordable carbon reduction. He advises on federal and state clean energy policy, helps prepare integrated resource plans, works with large customers and helps design new options for renewable energy, electrification and reducing emissions on the natural gas system. And Dan King is team lead of product development where his team builds new customer facing products and services related to renewable energy, energy storage, energy efficiency, electric vehicles and demand response. So I will pass the microphone over to the team from Excel Energy. Thanks, Amy. Um, this is Nick. I'm going to start off. Uh, this, this presentation will focus very much, it, it'll have 
quite a few numbers in it. It focuses very much on sort of the metrics and tools to help customers like Best Buy um, and all of our large customers do the kind of things that Dan, that, um, Dan set up really well. You know, you set these goals, but how do you measure progress? And we're going to talk both about tools for uh, CO2 emissions from scope two, uh, scope two CO2 emissions from purchase of electricity, as well as ways to uh, measure progress on renewable energy goals, mostly focused on large customers. If we have time, I have a little bit at the end about some similar tools for our communities. So if a community like a Minneapolis, for example, is setting goals, how does it uh, get the data that it needs? Um, and this will almost all be about electricity, actually. You know, clearly there's other parts of the carbon footprint. Um, Dan talked about natural gas use, transportation emissions. Those are all things that, um, that you know, uh, are also important for, for different customers and communities. And we have um, tools to sort of help them work on those parts of their carbon footprint. But this is most of the mechanics for electricity. Um, and really the, the um, what, what, what I'm gonna talk about mostly is the carbon related ones or greenhouse gas related ones. I'm gonna hand off to Dan uh, King to talk about uh, a, a really interesting tool for looking at renewable electricity uh, goals and progress on those. Um, and then we'll wrap up uh, with just some, some points at the end. You can do the next slide. The one thing I wanted to do, uh, Bridget, you can advance, yeah. The one thing I wanted to do just before jumping into the, the, the numbers um, is really to, to sort of set the context around um, what, uh, what Dan called the greening of the grid. So this is, this is just, uh, without getting lost in, in all the numbers, I just wanna highlight a few things here. This is Excel Energy System, looking back to 2005 to present, that's the left side of the screen, and then looking forward to our 2030 and 2050 goals. So what you'll see there over time is a really dramatic transition, more, uh, more renewables, more carbon-free energy, carbon-free energy meaning renewables and nuclear becoming a larger share of, of the overall mix, um, lower total CO2, tons of CO2, but more importantly for a, for a customer, lower CO2 intensity of purchased electricity. And that's, you know, Excel is being very aggressive about this, but this is really uh, happening across the industry, uh, more than anything due to the economics of clean energy. So this is the greening of the grid that is sort of helping companies like Best Buy and others achieve their goals even before you 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 know actions they may take to 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 purchase uh, dedicated renewables or anything like that. And so what you see, uh, um, for example, in the top left is from 2005 to 2019 coal ch changing from 56% to 26%, renewables going from 9% to 28%, total carbon-free energy going from 21% to 41%. And so as the energy mix changes, the next thing over you see the, the total carbon reduction, we've reduced 44% since 2005. That means we're more than halfway to our 80% by 2030 goal. Uh, we had our largest year-on-year -year reduction ever in 2019, about 10%, just from 2018 to 2019. And I won't go into it, but you know, the, the, the bottom chart shows uh, the, the same information for our Minnesota uh, or our upper Midwest operating company. So what you see is a, a, the, the grid has changed a lot already. And then on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, you know, um, you know, the question is, well, what's happening going forward? And um, Excel has set a goal to, to reduce 80% by 2030 and provide 100% carbon-free electricity by 2050. And one of the really interesting things that, um, that uh, we often get asked is, how do those goals compare to the climate science around limiting global temperature to two degrees or to one and a half degrees? So we had a, um, a, an IPCC lead author at the University of Denver try to answer that question for us uh, like by looking at um, global emission scenarios that are consistent with two degrees and with one and a half degrees, and then looking at industrialized country electric sector emissions within those scenarios. And that's what's shown by the gray sort of range. These are a range of 20 different scenarios that meet those temperature goals. And then we overlaid on that Excel Energy's progress to date and goals for the future. And you can see that we're on the bottom end of that range. There's a lot of interest also in one and a half degrees. We've got a similar um, 
uh, chart for that that shows we're also on the bottom end of that range. It's, it's, there's fewer scenarios that meet that, that temperature goal because it's a lot more challenging. But this is the, you know, this is where I expect XL Energy to go and I expect um, the, the whole electric sector to go uh, from the standpoint of the climate globally it, that's that's good news in relation to the global temperature goals, but from from the standpoint of uh, individual customers and communities, what that means is lower CO2 intensity per kilowatt hour, and that's what the rest of this presentation is going to be about. So next slide. Xcel Energy uh, began in 2005 reporting to the Climate Registry, which is a you know really, I, I think of as kind of industry leading best practice for, for very comprehensive greenhouse gas reporting. We've reported for 14 consecutive years. We're the only entity that's reported for that long. And um, what we do is uh, third party verified um, and uh, publicly disclosed on uh, the climate registry's uh, climate registry information system. So you can go find this information for all the utilities that report. Um, and the scope of it is basically um, what, what the climate registry does is provide both a general reporting protocol and an electric power sector protocol that, that very prescriptively tell uh, anyone who's reporting, in this case an electric utility, how to set the boundaries, how to account for all the different greenhouse gases. Uh, it includes the, the power plants we own, the power we purchase under long-term power purchase agreements, the power we purchase uh, in the wholesale markets like MISO. Um, and uh, so, it, so it, it includes both what Dan talked about as scope one, which is emissions from our own power plants. Scope two, which for us is a little different, it's actually line losses. And scope three, which is all the power that we purchase and supply to our, our customers. So it's, it's all very, um, uh, rigorously quantified and added up. And then we, um, we create some metrics uh, uh, around total CO2, but for, for, for your purposes around CO2 intensity, there's a couple different metrics that come out of our climate registry reporting that are especially useful. Um, so you can, you can go to that, um, that uh, cl climate registry information to find all this information. Um, Climate Registry is one of several places that we report, but I'm just kind of focusing on that because it's really the foundation of a lot of what we report to multiple different ESG uh, disclosure frameworks, uh, as, as Dan mentioned. So what I'm showing on these, this slide is two of the metrics we publish. Um, the one on the top is what's called scope to market-based reporting for, for entities, for large customers that, that want to report scope to emissions. They actually have the option of reporting something called location-based, which is sort of based on the region of the grid where you are. Dan talked about e-grid, that that data is uh, for a region or for a state. It's, it's a little bit older. It's also more um, generalized. So it doesn't actually reflect the, the utility that, that, that a particular facility is getting its electricity from. But it's useful because not all utilities provide exactly the same information. But, but um, for scope two reporting, uh, you also have the option of what's called market-based reporting. And that's what these numbers are. They are, ca they are calculated. Um, um, so for example, if you were, uh, if you had at a, a store in Colorado and you were trying to figure out its carbon footprint, you would, you could, uh, this is the number you would use in metric tons or in pounds per megawatt hour multiplied by the consumption at that um, location. Um, these are numbers that are uh, reflect, they're, they're specific to the utility, but they're the system average CO2 intensity. Now the number at the bottom is a little different. Um, a, a lot of customers are also interested in what, what's called a uh, residual mix. And, and what uh, residual mix is, that, that's um, a, a CO2 intensity that's been adjusted to reflect um, any um, special power products or sold recs. So let me explain that a little bit uh, more thoroughly. So when Xcel Energy, uh, for example, um, offers a, a, a special green tariff program like WindSource or Renewable Connect to, to a subset of customers who voluntarily choose that. And we retire renewable energy credits, RECs, on behalf of those customers so that they can claim to be using renewable energy. Um, 
or when we sell racks, we don't purchase many unbundled racks, but we do sell a small number each year. Those are uh, racks that have been sort of provided to a specific customer, right? So those need to be adjusted. Those need to be deducted out in calculating the residual mix CO2 rate that applies to everyone else. And that's what this, these numbers are. You'll see they're all a little bit higher than the numbers in the table on top. That's because those recs that have been either retired on behalf of specific companies, uh, customers, or sold have been subtracted out of the denominator. And that makes the CO2 intensity pounds per megawatt hour a little bit higher. And that's an important metric um, for, for some companies. Some companies report according to a protocol where they're, they're required to use that. Um, the last thing I wanna do before handing over to Dan is a question around, well, everything I've presented so far is for, the, you know, maybe it's for the prior year, which is great if you need to report, you know, what was my scope to electricity footprint, carbon footprint in 2019. But if you've set a goal and, you, you know, for 2030, for example, you really want to know what might that be in 2030. So how close, you know, if I can predict how much electricity I'm going to be using more or less in 2030, um, what is the CO2 emission rate that I can multiply that to predict what my electricity carbon footprint might be in 2030? So here we can't be as precise because we're not talking about actual measured data and third-party verification, but we can provide some, some numbers coming out of model, modeling for resource plants. So for example, in the, in the upper Midwest resource plan that Exo Energy has recently filed, that plan overall is, is um, proposing a pretty dramatic uh, transition in our, in our energy system. It's proposing to retire all of our coal plants in the upper Midwest by 2030, uh, maintain our nuclear plants, add about 6,000 megawatts of new renewables, do significantly more energy efficiency and demand management than we've done uh, even historically, although it's been a lot historically, so even push that further, and enable more electrification. So all that, what, what that means in that plan is that our energy uh, the, the energy mix that we will be providing to all customers in 2030, that's what's shown at the top, will increase to about 75% carbon free electricity by 2030 if the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission approves this plan. So that's really positive for customers that are thinking, well, what's going to be the carbon free share of my electricity? But, and if you'll just advance one more, Bridget, it'll all, it's also going to push down CO2 intensity from about 700 uh, pounds per, per, per megawatt hour today to 238 pounds per, per megawatt hour uh, by the end of that planning period. Um, so what that means is that um, as, as, as all those actions take place, the retirement of coal plants, maintaining nuclear and adding renewables, the CO2 intensity for every kilowatt hour that, that's being provided to all of our customers goes lower and lower, which means if you've got a carbon goal, it's, that's taking you a long way toward your goal. Now, maybe it doesn't take you all the way there and you still want to do some uh, renewable energy purchasing to get the rest of the way there, but it's really, this is what I'm talking about, the sort of greening of the grid or the clean energy transition that's helping all of our customers uh, not have to do as much to, uh, to eliminate their carbon footprint from electricity, if that's what their goal is. And the reason I think that's really important is that means that those customers, if they've got a finite budget for addressing their whole carbon footprint, can allocate more of that budget toward, say, natural gas use or transportation. So this, yeah, I'm gonna stop there, hand off to Dan to talk more specifically about um, renewable energy goals, and then I'll, I'll come back at the end with a, with a few, few wrap up points. Great, thanks, Nick. Um, and I'll just be providing a relatively brief interlude here, kind of specifically about um, renewable energy goal reporting. Um, you know, there's a reason that our company goals are really structured around that carbon reduction targets that Nick um, highlighted there, that that's the ultimate most foundational metric that we're trying to reduce the carbon associated with the electricity we deliver to customers. But of course, underlying that is renewable energy, and that's a really important part of a lot of um, goals that companies and entities are setting. And as we saw in that um, <clears throat> survey up front, the wide variety of goals that organizations are setting, and some of those really are centered around um, renewable energy. 
And if that is kind of the, the structure of your goal, um, then <clears throat> we've put forth a kind of a new metric that we're reporting out that can hopefully help clarify how to take into account the screening of the grid into that renewable energy goal. So this is just pulling out one bit from the, the information that, that Nick presented in that first slide, just showing again, a different view of the dramatic change in the energy mix um, from that 2005 baseline year um, to where we're projecting to go uh, in 2030, where we'll be um, around 60% uh, renewable energy. This is company-wide, so um, not just Minnesota specific. So you can go to the next slide. So what I'll be talking about here briefly is the uh, certified renewable percentage, which you can, we've been, Nick was going to carbon intensity there, and you can kind of think of this as the renewable intensity. This is a new kind of reporting structure that we're trying to voluntarily put out there. Um, it's not, uh, there's not something quite like the climate registry that we can point to externally for how to do this, although this information is really all kind of embedded in and baked into the type of reporting we do there. And, um, you know, we've confirmed with the climate re registry that this is consistent with that um, type of, uh, of reporting we're doing there. But what this is, is it clarifies uh, to customers the renewable energy portion that's backed by RECs retired both for res compliance and additional recs that we will voluntarily retire on behalf of all of our retail customers, not on any, not for a specific customer. Uh, so this includes uh, recs retired for compliance. You know, those are retired to demonstrate our, you know, our obligations to deliver a certain portion of renewable energy to customers. But that really does represent delivered energy that we think customers should be able to um, take credit for. And there's been some lack of clarity around that. And so we just wanted to put out this number that shows if we include that and then we include additional incremental recs, what is the number? So this is not a product or a program that you need to sign up for or en enroll in. We have options for those renewable energy products that I'll, I'll touch on briefly that Nick uh, mentioned that you can do if you individually. Uh, want to purchase that renewable energy to go farther. But um, the CRP is really about kind of what Amy alluded to up front about that collective action of everybody kind of um, moving together and the transition of the system as a whole um, and, and, and representing how you as a customer of Excel Energy can, um, can take credit for that. I'll just mention briefly that this is a different metric and it doesn't replace kind of what we still will talk about, what I talked about um, in that chart initially. Uh, in terms of the renewables as a percentage of generation. It's gonna be a little bit different because we have some adjustments that go into this, but, um, and you know, if, 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 if you care about the, you know, the renewable percentage that's backed by REC retirements, this is the number to use, uh, but that's still a very highly relevant number, the just renewables as a portion of our total generation, and that's ultimately what goes into the carbon calculations. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a simplified version. There's a lot that goes into this, but I didn't want to go into all the details here. But basically, essentially, we just take the total renewable energy generated each year. We make a whole bunch of adjustments to take out any RECs that are associated with specific voluntary programs, any RECs that we sell if we do sell them, um, wholesale REC transfers that, um, or you know, RECs that are a portion of the RECs for energy that's kind of delivered not to retail customers. We're not trying to shift that um, that kind of renewable attribution from one type of customer class to another. Uh, so we're trying to be kind of thorough and transparent with how we're doing this. There's a lot that goes into that. And then we just divide that by the total energy, total retail sales, total energy used by all retail customers. And that gives us a percentage. We started doing this for um, year 2018, um, at which it was around 26%. We're still finalizing 2019, which will be about that same amount. The first few years we're doing this, it's really probably going to track closely to the um, renewable energy standard. Uh, but if you go to the next slide here, I think this, yeah, so this shows just in the relatively near future, um, you know, as that uh, transition really takes hold here, we'll be rapidly approaching the, um, you know, the 50% mark on the certified renewable percentage and, you know, headed towards hopefully around 60% um, by the end of the decade. And so Nick, you know, touched on kind of forecasting here and there's some difficulty, you know, in terms of providing some certainty here. We're working on, you know, new and better ways and kind of continually refining this going forward. 
what we have here is, you know, it shows in the, the black line there is kind of the baseline of what, what will happen just from the renewable energy standard. So you can, you can count on that much because we're obligated to do that. Uh, with our kind of currently approved resource plan is that dark green bar. Uh, that's what we would expect this to take with that plan. Um, we expect, we're almost certain to go higher than that. Um, and this is not with the latest adjustments. It's slightly different in terms of the upper, it's, I wouldn't necessarily call it the upper bound, but the, the possible with the next resource plan is, uh, is where we'd like to go with that. So hopefully the CRP will be kind of towards the upper end of this, but the exact timing does depend on when exact resources come online. Um, so we'll try to update our forecast um, you know, as, as we move forward and get more information about what this is gonna look like. Uh, but this is kind of the, the trend we're seeing of where it's going to go. You go to the next slide. Um, and we do have a, a, you know, a tool online here. Uh, this, you can get this from our website that we call the My Renewable Mix Calculator um, that you can enter in kind of your annual usage, your participation in um, renewable programs, and you know, it will show you kind of what your total renewable energy percentage is taking into account the certified renewable percent. Um, so you can go to our website and download this and play around with it if you'd like. Uh, next slide. And, you know, so again, we're trying to position this as kind of the foundation, the certified renewable percentage. You can, that's not something you sign up for. It's just something we report and you can count it if you would like. Um, you also have the option to kind of structure your goal. Um, otherwise, if, if, um, if, if you want to kind of meet it through a different manner. Uh, but we also do offer a variety of um, renewable energy options uh, that you can participate in. Um, I won't go through them all here, but you know, there's options for um, having on-site uh, renewable generation. Uh, you can participate in, in solar rewards and receive uh, production incentives. Um, and with that, then you would not receive the REC attribution. The RECs then go to the system to be managed on behalf of all customers. That's part of what that incentive payment is for. And then there's different subscription options to Renewable Connect and WindSource, which uh, deliver energy from specific uh, resources along with the, the RECs. And, um, and then there's also um, uh, community solar subscriptions. So you can participate in the solar energy market um, but you, in most of those, depending on how it's structured, most of those you would not uh, receive the REC attribution for those. So you can go on to the next slide. And I think that's where I'll hand it back to Nick. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, I just have a couple more, but maybe uh, there's a couple questions that have come in in the chat that I think I can clarify uh, pretty quickly. Uh, there, there was one question around, uh, our Xcel Energy's goals being 80% carbon free um, or 80% carbon reduction. And it's the latter. So our, our 2030 goal is for total CO2 to be 80% below our 2005 baseline. So um, that's, that's actually different from the carbon free share, which would be the share of total generation coming from carbon free resources like renewables and nuclear. And so I think what, what might have created the confusion there is I showed the chart of that carbon free energy mix being 75%, for example, for our upper Midwest company in 2030. That means 75% of the megawatt hours uh, uh, would come from carbon free sources. The total tons of CO2, which I showed on the chart below that, actually is about 81% below 2005. So that's the, that's the nuance there. It just kind of depends on, on which, uh, which metric you're looking at. But our goal is in terms of a percent reduction in total CO2. Um, there was another question around uh, natural gas, our natural gas business. And so we, uh, the, the goals that I talked about are, are for the electricity side of our business. They do encompass uh, the, the, the use of natural gas for power generation. So natural gas, among all the other resources that we use for power generation, emissions from, from all of those resources will be 80% below uh, 2005 and 2030 and 100% uh, carbon free in 2050. Um, Excel is also a natural gas utility in some of our states. 
Um, and we have not yet set a specific numerical goal for uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from natural gas use that we, your natural gas that we provide for you know, heating buildings and running manufacturing processes and many other things. Uh, but we have rolled out and we are rolling out um, a pretty comprehensive strategy to look at reducing greenhouse gas emissions in all parts of the natural gas supply chain, which means there's a small part in the middle of the chain that really XM Energy does control, that's our distribution system. So that's, uh, we have uh, done a lot of work to, to reduce uh, any, any amount of leakage from the distribution system that's actually very low. A larger part upstream of us, our suppliers, we're exerting some uh, influence on our suppliers to reduce methane leakage upstream of us. That's outside our control, but you know we, we can try to have some influence there by requiring more disclosure and so on. And then downstream of us, our customers' emissions from burning natural gas in their homes and businesses, also uh, outside our control, but we're, we're thinking about ways that we can um, through a combination of efficiency, uh, electrification, and lower carbon um, fuels, lower carbon uh, replacements for natural gas, like renewable natural gas, um, help our customers reduce those emissions. So we don't have a specific numerical goal, but we're certainly um, working on that side of our business as well and rolling out ways to reduce greenhouse ga gas emissions in all parts of that uh, supply chain. So I wanna wrap up just with, with a couple points and then we'll have a little more time for q and I won't talk much about this, uh, what on the screen now because uh, Dan has already brought it up, but I just wanted to highlight this for, for those of you who haven't gone to, to, gone to download it yet. I think this is a really valuable tool because, you know, maybe, you know, you've got facilities in Xcel Energy Service Territory and you can get this data and you've got everything you need, right? But you might have facilities in a hundred other utility service territories and ideally you'd like to have consistent, uh, consistent across utilities data that's uh, annually updated and that provides you these kind of CO2 intensity and energy mix data for all of your utilities. So this is exactly what uh, the Whoops, Nick, I think we were getting a little background noise from you. Yeah, no, I don't think that was there from me. I, I could hear it as well. Um, okay, okay, thanks. So EEI has done a lot of work to collect from about half of its members, about half of all the investor-owned utilities in the U.S., and, and about 43% of total electricity sold in the U.S. is now, they've collected data from all those utilities and put it into a single template, and it provides CO2 intensity metrics, the same as what I showed for Excel, so a, a kind of an average one and a residual mix one, as well as the energy mix for uh, a lot of different utilities. And, uh, and that's a very useful uh, tool that I would recommend to folks. Um, it's available on the EI website and there's a link to it in the slides that we can send out or also put in the chat. Um, next slide is what Dan already showed, Xcel Energy's entry in this, to, in this tool for all of our different service companies, but you can see that for many different utilities. So very handy thing to look at. Um, Next slide, uh, I just wanted to mention, and we won't end up having much time to think about, uh, to talk about this, but as I said at the beginning, a lot of our communities are also setting, you know, carbon goals or renewable energy goals. And so um, what Excel uh, generates community energy reports each year for all communities over 5,000 people in population. So there's about 200 of those communities that we serve. And you can go on Excel's website look up your community, first set the website to your state, look up your community and get a community energy report that provides quite a lot of useful data. What's on the screen here is only a portion of what's in these reports, but I just wanted to highlight, you know, this is a Minneapolis example. This, in this is the same uh, scope two market-based reporting rate uh, in, in terms of metric tons of CO2. Um, and in here we show total electricity consumption for Minneapolis. So, uh, you know, the, the, the total electricity consumption number multiplied by the CO2 rate shows that for the, the total CO2 electricity footprint of Minneapolis is here in, in the bottom right. And then you can look at energy mix information, you can look at information on total participation in voluntary renewable programs. There's a lot of useful information there. So if you're with a city that's doing a climate action plan, for example, uh, and, and has, hasn't yet sort of uh, downloaded this report, urge you to look at that. 
And then finally, my, my kind of wrap up slide, the next one, Bridget, um, I, I just wanted to sort of try to bring out a few high level, higher level points after we've talked about so many numbers. Um, the first one is we know that our customers and communities need uh, consistent and robust tools to measure their scope to CO2. Um, where I think it's really important that uh, this, this information be publicly accessible, third party verified, uh, and consistent across utilities, because we know that you have a lot of utilities. Um, and we think you need some, some amount of future forecasting because your, your goals are for the future. So we're trying to sort of do what we can to provide that, that as well. And then secondly, um, I, I just wanted to kind of reemphasize that this, this transition that's continuing in the, across the industry, what that means for a customer is that the CO2 per megawatt hour is moving down and the certified renewable percentage is moving up. And so that I really want to kind of highlight that, that there's, there's a real potential there for on a higher level, something that Amy talks a lot about, sort of large customer utility partnership on the system-wide transition, um, influencing that transition and then taking credit for it. Historically, a lot of the existing renewable energy frameworks have tended to focus just on, for, for a company, just on matching your consumption with on-site renewables, which can be pretty expensive. Uh, or which can be made affordable only because costs are being shifted onto other customers, not a great way to achieve your corporate goals. And, and they haven't really allowed companies to take credit for increasing renewables at the system level. And, and in that way, they're sort of pitting uh, large customers and utilities against each other, or you know, not really working together on sort of engineering this overall transition and then taking credit for it. So what we're really trying to do here with the tools that Dan and I have talked about, you know, is, is provide ways for you to look at how the overall system is changing. You're, as, as customers, you're paying for all the resources that are bringing CO2 intensity down and bringing renewable percentage up. So we want you to be able to take credit for those. Um, and, we, and by doing so, we also think that that will hopefully free, free up resources to focus your budgets on other parts of the carbon footprint. So I think there's, there's a lot of kind of mutual benefit in being able to use these metrics to sort of um, uh, reflect the transition that's happening um, and also uh, influence it to make it happen faster. I'll stop there. Well, so much great information. We are just chock full here. Uh, we could probably talk all day long, but I just want to say thank you so much to all of our speakers. We took some questions as we were rolling in and hopefully saw in the chat box, we were um, also answering some questions. So take a look at those if you didn't get a chance to take a look at that. And I think Jillian, if you want to click to the slide 73, uh, we just once again want to thank Daniel, Nick, and Dan. We like to have a lot of Dan K's involved with our speaking opportunities these days, apparently. Um, so that was just great. And I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of ways to get involved. Hopefully this has piqued your interest and let you know about some other opportunities to get involved. If you would like to learn more about getting involved with the coalition and what membership entails, you can click um, on the link there, check out our website. We have a newsletter. You can let Bridget know if you're interested in joining that. Also, as a leader, if you would like to use your voice, to talk about your organization's clean energy leadership, there's a number of ways to do that in the public affairs space, such as writing an op-ed, a letter to the editor, talking to your legislator about your personal interests, your organizational interests. We have new tools that will be coming out, including a circularity toolkit, additional case studies, and we have a suite of events coming up, including our circularity task force, our energy strategy team, and it is our fifth anniversary, so we're going to be doing a series of events in the fall, including webinars, C-suite roundtable, a social hour, and we also have a policy forum in the fall that some of you might be interested in that environmental initiative is hosting. And Bridget put in the chat box a link for a mentee poll. We would love to get your feedback because we are um, continued as we did in 2019. Uh, number of webinars and so we would love to get your feedback on how we can better meet, meet your needs. So please click on the mentee poll that's in the chat box and I think there is a slide too, Jillian, if you want to click on the next slide just to let people know what that is all about. 
And I see a couple resources being offered up in the chat box for reports and links for more information. And of course, we have that there about our case study as well. So thank you all for joining and to all of our speakers and have a great day.